Thank you. Please be seated. We're engaged in the process of seeking to grasp the big picture of the Bible, the big picture of God's plan for the ages. And um, we're doing that because lots of times our study of God's word is like the examination of an elephant by these blind individuals. When we study just one part here or there, we come up with an emphasis that may be incorrect or an observation that may not be correct. So instead, we're trying to get the big picture. The big picture we saw began with Abraham's covenant with Israel as God's chosen people. God established that choice and entered into that relationship with Abraham. And then we saw last week in the rest of the Old Testament that Israel's rebellion produced her kingdom displacement that the nation of Israel was removed from their position of prominence and priority in God's plan. So it goes like this. We have this promise that's given to Abraham. All the way back in Genesis 12. First 11 chapters cover 2,000 years, and then we start with Abraham at 2,000. And from Abraham, we have this promise, and God works in the nation of Israel over about 1,000 years to bring us to Solomon. And when he brings us to Solomon, what we have is the apex, the zenith, if you will, the high point of the history of Israel in the Old Testament. God said to Solomon after he dedicated the temple, if you will walk before me as your father David walked, even according to all that I've commanded you, and will keep my statutes and my ordinances, then I will establish your royal throne as I covenanted with your father David saying, you shall not lack a man to be ruler in Israel. And Solomon's kingdom was glorious. It was amazing. When the queen of Sheba came to visit, she was impressed with all of the aspects of his kingdom. But as we saw last time, Solomon turned away. At the height of his glory and wisdom, he disobeyed the Lord, turned away from him, and as a result of that, we have then the record in the rest of the Old Testament of the prophets coming again and again to the nation of Israel. And so we read up here, the Lord, the God of their fathers, sent word to them again and again by his messengers because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place, his own temple. But they continually mocked the messengers of God, despised his words, scoffed at the prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people until there was no remedy, therefore he brought the king of the Chaldeans and led the nation of Israel into captivity and allowed the city to be destroyed, allowed his temple to be destroyed, and all of the precious things that were part of that worship of Yahweh was totally destroyed and or taken to Babylon. The Old Testament then sort of closes with the return of Israel coming back to the land. In Ezra chapter 1, as well as at the end of the book of Second Chronicles, we have the statement that Cyrus, the Persian king, was raised up by God at the end of the 70 years that he had prophesied, and he allowed the people of Israel to come back, and they began the process of rebuilding, not to the glory that was before, and they lived under Gentile domination. So that brings us then to the New Testament. And as we come to the New Testament, what we find is that the people of Israel continue to reject the Messiah that Jesus sends to them. There's sort of three movements as you think of the ministry of Jesus, which paves the way for an understanding of God's kingdom program. First of all, Jesus offers Israel the kingdom. What we have is Jesus coming to be born as king of the Jews. The very first line of the New Testament says, the record of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And the names David and Abraham are reversed on purpose. And so that very first verse of the very first book of the New Testament highlights the fact that Jesus came to be a king. And so we have a royal genealogy. It's not like the genealogies of the Old Testament. It's, it's one that the school children use to memorize the, the leadership
leaders of Israel from Abraham all the way down through the kings to their day. And Jesus' father, Joseph, was the crown prince. He would have been king had there been a Jewish king at that time, but there was not. And then we find that in the announcement to, um, to Mary, the words of Jesus here as that he would be, or the words of Gabriel rather, that Jesus would be the king. The Ga Gabriel said, don't be afraid, Mary, you found favor with God. Behold, you'll conceive in your womb and bear a son, you'll name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Clearly, Gabriel is saying that Jesus is the Messiah who is coming to reign over the nation of Israel, over the kingdom of David that was given in the Old Testament and that was promised to the nation of Israel. Then in, also in connection with Jesus' birth, we have the royal visitors, the magi who come. And the text tells us that they showed up in Jerusalem saying, where is he who was born king of the Jews? We have seen his star in the east and we have come to worship him. And Herod and all of the city of Jerusalem were troubled because of this. And you know the story about what Herod's response when he discerned from the prophets that it was in Bethlehem that Jesus, the Messiah, was to be born. He sent the wise men and asked them to respond to him. And when they didn't come back, he sent the soldiers and slaughtered all of the baby boys, two years of age and under, in the city of, of Bethlehem. And so what we have is a clear indication as we begin the Gospels that Jesus is the Messiah. And then we have what I would call his kingdom discourse in Matthew chapter 5. We have Jesus coming on the scene as he prepares for this, and he says both in Matthew 4 and in Luke 4, as well as in the Gospel of Mark, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Nowhere in any of the Gospels do any of the Jewish people say, what do you mean kingdom of heaven? What kingdom are you talking about? They all knew. They all were looking for the king. They all were looking for a kingdom. And so when he makes that statement, right away the anticipation is, is heightened. And then we have him in the synagogue in Nazareth, at, again at the outset of his ministry. He picks up the scroll from Isaiah and reads, in Isaiah chapter 61, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and sat back down and he said to them, today, this scripture is being fulfilled in your hearing. And so he is proclaiming to the synagogue there in Nazareth that he is the Old Testament Messiah, the Deliverer who has come. And then, of course, we have the Sermon on the Mount, the discourse of the kingdom that Jesus gives. And everything in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is Jesus' presentation about this kingdom. Blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek, blessed are the humble, and so forth, as he says... The values of the kingdom of heaven are different from the values of the kingdoms of this earth. And this is his statement. This is his thesis, if you will, of this sermon on the mount. He says, whoever annuls one of the least of the commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven for I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds that or surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. This sermon is all about entering the kingdom of heaven. It's all about how kingdom people live. And so Jesus is presenting to the nation of Israel his kingdom at this point. And so Jesus comes to offer himself as the king. But as you know, Jesus' offer is rejected. And so as a result of that rejection, Jesus announces a postponement of the kingdom. The rejection is highlighted for us in an interesting event that takes place in Matthew chapter 12. 
in this chapter, there was a demon-possessed man who was brought to Jesus. He was blind, and he was unable to speak, perhaps deaf also, but he was blind and unable to speak, and Jesus healed him. And when he healed him, all of the crowds were amazed. He did it on purpose to point out the fact that he indeed is a representative of God and that he was ministering for God in this world. And all the crowd was amazed and says, this cannot be the son of David, can he? Waiting for a positive answer. The people in the crowd knew that this was an indication of who Jesus was. But look, it says, when the Pharisees heard this, they said, this man casts out demons only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons. And so they rejected the obvious. <clears throat> the obvious act of Jesus in delivering this man who was demon oppressed, who was, who was, who was given this blindness and, and his inability to speak by the demons, they deliberately reject. And so as a result of that, Jesus then rejects them. He says, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, the kingdom of God has come upon you. How can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first binds the strong man? Then he will plunder his house. He's talking about plundering Satan's house. He's talking about kiss, kicking out the demon. And he goes on to say, he who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters. Therefore I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. What Jesus did, he did in the power of the Spirit. He walked in the Spirit just as he asked us to walk today. And he carried out his ministry in the power of the Spirit. And they said, you don't do this by the Spirit. You do this by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, by Satan himself. And Jesus says, you can blaspheme me all you want. But when you blaspheme the Spirit, when you take the obvious work of the Spirit of God, it just doesn't make sense to say that Satan is casting out Satan. A house divided against itself cannot stand. And so it doesn't make any sense. And he says to them, there is no forgiveness for you. So these religious leaders are written off by Jesus at this point. It's at this point that we move into chapter 13 of Matthew, which we read. It says, in that day, Jesus went out and sat by the sea. What do you do when you've been rejected? When somebody really hurts you, you head off somewhere into nature, right? You want to go for a long walk in the woods. You want to go down to the beach and sit on the beach. You, wanna, you just want to get away from people, and that's what Jesus did. He went out and sat by the sea. But when he went out and sat by the sea, all the people came around him. And so that's when he started then to teach in these parables. And his, his, his teaching, first the parable of the sower, and then the parable of the, uh, of the soils, rather, and then the parable of, of the tares and so on, Jesus begins to instruct the people. And the disciples come to him at this point, and they say to him, why are you teaching in, in parables? Now, they wouldn't ask that question if they were used to him teaching in parables. So this indicates a change in his ministry. When they say, why are you teaching in parables? He says to them, to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. And so Jesus is now beginning to teach the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. He's, going to, he's beginning to teach something that was not seen in the Old Testament, that was not known previously. That's what a mystery is. And he says, um, to, to those who, who have, more shall be given. To those who do not have, it shall be taken away. And so to the disciples, he's going to give them insight. Jesus teaches in parables for three reasons. One, parables make things graphic for us. Two, parables communicate truth to believers. And three, parables hide the truth from unbelievers. And so he teaches in these parables, and for the people who have rejected him, it sounds like a nice story about gardening and goes right over their heads. But to the people who are his believers, to the disciples, he's teaching them about how the kingdom, this mystery form of the kingdom, is going to work. 
he develops it further a couple chapters later when when away with the disciples he says to them who do people say that i am and peter says to him lord you are the christ the son of the living god and jesus responds to him and says blessed are you simon barjona flesh and blood did not reveal this to you you didn't get this from a man you got this from my father in heaven and i say to you you are peter and upon this rock i will build my church and the gates of hades will not overpower it so the church is the mystery form of the kingdom jesus came to offer the jewish kingdom to israel they rejected him the rejection was final on the triumphal entry when he came into the city that day and there was all of this parade and people were responding but nobody really embraced him as messiah they said he's a prophet and now jesus is introducing the mystery form of the kingdom and so he tells his disciples a little bit about the church but he doesn't go into it very much if you check out the gospels there are only two places in all of the Gospels where the word church is mentioned. And so Jesus does not develop it fully. He is preparing his disciples for the adjustment, for the change that's going to take place because he's not going to be king right now. It's left for the Apostle Paul to develop this further. So the Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 3, by referring to this, that's what Paul's writing in the book of Ephesians. When you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. This is the mystery that Jesus was talking about in Matthew 13, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men. So what Paul's writing about in Ephesians was not made known in previous generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the spirit. To be specific, what's being revealed is that Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel, of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace which was given to me. Now, he goes on. To me, the very least of saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things. So Paul says it wasn't revealed before, but Jesus came and revealed to me the details of this mystery, the administration of this mystery. Some of you wrestle with the whole idea of dispensationalism. See that word administration right in the center? That's the word dispensation. Way back in the day, it was translated dispensation. It's been adjusted over the course of years to be translated as administration. So to bring to light what is the dispensation of the mystery which was hidden for ages. And he goes on to say, so that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in heavenly places with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's our philosophy of history right there. That, that, that God wants to, to have the wisdom and the, and the glory of God manifested to the authorities in the heavenly places. Who are the authorities in the heavenly places? They're the angels. So the purpose of God in creating man, the purpose of God in creating the kingdom program, the purpose of God in creating the church is to make the manifold wisdom and the glory of God known to the angels in glory who, who are the observers of the rebellion of Satan that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. So the Apostle Paul is laying out for us this mystery of Jesus, which Jesus just sort of teased as he walked through the, part, the latter parts of his ministry. Paul goes on as he talks about the relationship between Jews and Gentiles. The kingdom was Jewish, right? The church is primarily Gentile. Here's Paul's explanation. 
if some of the branches were broken off and you being a wild olive, you Gentiles are wild olives, were grafted in among them and became partaker of them, um, of, of the rich root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are arrogant, remember it's not you who support the root, but the root supports you. So what Paul's saying is, the, Gentile, the, the Jews are like the stump of the tree that you see in the picture there, and the Gentiles and the church are like those twigs which are grafted in, and God's going to grow this amazing program on the basis of what he has done for Israel, and this amazing program is the church that Jesus is building. He says the branches were broken off, so you'll say the branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Quite right, Paul says. They were broken off for their unbelief. But you stand by your faith. Do not be conceited, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. If you get arrogant, God's not going to spare you either. If you reject what he's doing in this program of extending redemption and salvation to Gentiles, he's not going to spare you either. Behold then the kindness and severity of God to those who fell severity, but to you, God's kindness, if you continue in that kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. And then he concludes that little section with these words. He says, for if you are cut off from what is by nature a wild olive and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will those of the natural branches be grafted back into their olive tree? So the Jewish people are going to be grafted back in at a, at a given time in the future. I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, he says, or uninformed in this translation, of this mystery so you'll not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. And then a couple of verses later it says, from the standpoint of the gospel, they, the, G the Jews, are enemies for your sake, but from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. In other words, the promises that God has made to Israel are irrevocable. So today... If a Jewish person wants to be in the kingdom of God, he has to come into the church. I want to show you a video here, and so we'll, we'll switch to that if we may. The man in the video is um, the chair of the um, Department of Synthetic Organic Chemistry at Rice University. An amazing testimony. He has um, hundreds of articles that he has written and also of patents and so forth. He has a, his undergraduate degree from Syracuse. His PhD is, is, from, um, is from Purdue in organic chemistry, which is way up here. And he's one of the top 10 organic chemists in the world. I, I have a whole page on him that I won't bore you with. But if we can roll the video, I think you'll be really interested. I got my PhD in the field of organic chemistry, postdoc at Stanford University. Joined the group of a man who was going to win a Nobel Prize in chemistry. Voted one of the top 50 most influential minds in the world. I was a visiting scholar at Harvard University. I've spoken at every major university in this country. Have over 650 research publications. Voted the R&D Magazine Scientist of the Year. I'm in the National Academy of Inventors. I'm a member of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Over 120 patents. Started seven or eight companies. We work in areas that range from medicine to material science to electronics, computer memory, medical devices. We work across a broad range of areas. But more than any of that, what means the most to me is that I'm a Jew who believes that Jesus is the Messiah. I grew up just outside of New York City. I thought everybody was Jewish. I didn't even know that there was anything else. I had no particular interest in that. 
other than when all my friends were getting bar mitzvahed or bat mitzvahed, and then I would attend, of course, every week. There was never really any excitement for me. I remember once I even tried to talk to a, a rabbi. He just brushed me off. There was very little explanation for me. I remember uh, when I went to college, I started meeting a number of people that said that they were born-again Christians, which was sort of an odd term. I was, what's born again? What do you mean, born again? One person saw me in the laundry room. He said, do you mind if I give you an illustration of the gospel? And I remember we sat there and he actually started to draw a picture, a cliff with a, with a man on one side and he drew a little man and then another cliff with God on the other side and a big chasm in between that he labeled with sin. And I looked at him, I said, I'm not a sinner. I've never killed anyone. I never robbed a bank. How could I be a sinner? And he had me read a verse from the Bible, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In modern Judaism, we never really talked about sin. I don't remember ever talking about sin in my home. So he turned to another passage. Jesus said, I say to you that everyone who looks upon a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Pow! I felt just as if I had been punched right in the chest. Here I was, new in college. I didn't think anybody knew. I would pick up these magazines and I became addicted to pornography. It was just through those magazines. And all of a sudden, Something that's written in the Bible, somebody from lived, who lived 2,000 years ago is calling me out on it. And I felt immediately convicted and that now I realized I was a sinner when I read in the scriptures what sin is and I knew I was a sinner. How am I going to get to God? We Jews know this better than anyone else. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. This description in Isaiah 53 of how he will bear upon himself my sin, the things that I had done, and this was him. This was the man that took this upon himself on the cross. The perfect God comes and gives himself for us. He is the one that gives himself for us. I started to realize how Jewish the New Testament is. This book is so Jewish. The New Testament is so Jewish. It's all around Jewish people. And then on November 7th, 1977, I was all alone in my room. The realization that Yeshua is the one who died on the cross. And I said, Lord, I am a sinner. Please forgive me. Come into my life. And then all of a sudden, Someone was in my room, and I opened my eyes. I was on my knees, I opened my eyes. Who was in my room? That man, Jesus Christ, stood in my room. This amazing sense of God. Jesus was in my room, and I wasn't scared. All I started doing was just weeping. The presence was so glorious, because he was there in my room on that day. And I didn't want to get up. And this amazing sense of forgiveness just started to come upon me. That was it. Finally, I got up. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know who to tell. Here's this Jewish kid from New York City. What am I going to say? My cousins were shocked. How could you do that? You're Jewish. Telling my mother how I had invited Jesus into my life. She didn't say much. She was weeping. She told my father they weren't happy at all. And she said, I don't blame them for killing Jesus after the things that he said. Who is he to come against these religious leaders that have dedicated their lives to helping people and to tell them that they are whitewashed tombs? Who is he, this young man in his 30s, to say this to these scholars? He got what he deserved. And my mother's a very deep, pensive, careful reader. She read from Genesis right on through the Tanakh, the whole thing. When she got done, 
I said, what do you think? She said, God warned us over and over again. He warned us. When my daughter was about 15, my mother and father came to visit us. At one point, my mother went into her room for several hours. She came out. She said, quite a young girl you have. She talked to me for a long time. She started reading the Bible again, both the Old and the New Testament. One day, not long after that, she called me on the phone at the age of 72. She said, Jimmy, you wouldn't believe what happened. I said, what happened? She said, I was just reading, and it hit me. It hit me, the way he gave his life. I believe it now. Jesus is the Son of God. Amen. He says it all in terms of what, <clears throat> excuse me, what people have to do. We have to be born again. That's what Jesus said to Nicodemus. That's what he struggled with initially. But it's the answer. It's how we get into the church. Not grace way. How we get into the body of Christ. This mystery kingdom that Jesus is building. It's primarily Gentiles, but it's wide open to Jewish people as well. And so this is the interim period, if you will. This is God's program for today. And so he's reaching out to millions and millions of Jewish people, of Arab, of Arab people, Arab-speaking people, from various parts of the earth, as well as Gentiles all over the earth. I was thinking as I was watching this, <clears throat> we have our own genius college professor speaking tonight. I hope you'll be here for that one, too, as you hear uh, Dr. Arbege share his testimony. In the third movement, of Jesus, there are three, there's several discourses of Jesus, but three major ones for us this morning. The first one is his kingdom discourse, that's the Sermon on the Mount. The second one is the parables discourse in Matthew 13, and that's the postponement of the kingdom. And the third discourse is Matthew chapter 24 and 25, and that's called the Olivet Discourse. And in this discourse, Jesus promises that the kingdom that he originally came to offer will come. He says, for example, in Matthew, or Matthew records for us in Matthew 24, verses 3 and 4, as he's sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him and said to him, tell us, when will these things be? What will happen? What will be the sign of your coming and the sign of the end of the age? Jesus' answer was first, see that no one misleads you, and then he gave them the signs. The signs that are going to take place once he removes the church and we start down this tribulation period leading up to the coming of Jesus. And he says, <clears throat> for just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. There's going to be some kind of a sign in the sky, like what the wise men saw to lead them to Jesus. Some kind of a sign. It may be a cross. It may be the letter key, the first word, letter in the word Christ. Whatever it is, it's going to be obvious to the whole world. The sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels um, with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. Um, Later on in that same discourse, Jesus says in Matthew 25, but when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. And all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And so Jesus clearly is talking about his return to be the king over the earth. And so the uh, disciples were told by 
two angels as Jesus ascends into heaven, visibly ascends in their sight. Two men stood by them, the text says, as they were gazing intently in the sky. And they said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. And so Jesus will come to bring his kingdom here on this earth. It's laid out for us in the book of Revelation as Jesus reveals the things that are going to happen at the end. John says, I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he who sat on it is called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire and on his head many diadems. He has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood. His name is called the word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, and he will use that to slay the nations and establish his kingdom. The next chapter goes on to say that he will reign for a thousand years here on this earth as he sets up his kingdom here. And then at the end of that thousand years, his kingdom will be transferred into glory, and he will reign forever. That's the story of the New Testament. And so as we put that together, we understand that there is a millennial kingdom that's coming. That's why we are pre-millennial. It's why we are dispensational. We understand there are different administrations that God has established for the ordering of this world. And we are in an administration called the mystery kingdom or the church. It's a time when God is reaching out in a major way to Gentiles, but the day is coming when he restores that kingdom program to the nation of Israel. So we ought to then respect God's choice of Israel. Now, God loves the Arab peoples. He loves, he loves all of the people, the face of the earth. Jesus died for everyone, but he has a special relationship with the Jewish people that goes all the way back 4,000 years ago when he called Abram and he established that relationship with him. And it will be fleshed out and fulfilled eventually with Jesus. And so we ought to evangelize all men in the same way that Dr. James Tour shared with us his testimony this morning. It's, it's needed that every single person would come to faith in Jesus, would be born again. Jesus says, unless a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. There is no other way. And so we need to be those who share the gospel with everybody around us as we are engaged in that kingdom process. And we ought to be praying, as Jesus taught his disciples, your kingdom come. For us today, that's the church. We ought to be praying that God would continue to build the church, bringing in Gentiles and Jews and Arabs and and Greeks and whoever into his kingdom. That's our calling as we serve him. That's the big picture. Dads, your job is to give the big picture to your family, to to give the big picture to your children, to your grandchildren, to your household. It's our calling to provide that so that we have a grasp of what it is that God is doing in this world and we live in harmony with him and with his plan. Father, help us as we seek to be the servants that you want us to be. Help us to have the proper picture, to understand your hand on this world, to understand what you're doing through Jesus now, what you will do through Jesus in the future. Help us to be a part of that kingdom. First and foremost, as Jesus himself said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Help us to be kingdom people first. It's in Jesus' name that we ask these things. Amen. Worship team, come, if you will. Let's sing together as we conclude.